Welcome everyone to the mini lecture on snake bites. So the learning objectives for week 11, we've covered the first three in the main lecture and this one, this mini lecture, we're going to focus mainly on snake bites. So how does snake venom work? Well, if you try to think of what is the snake trying to do to the mouse? Well, firstly, it wants the mouse to become paralyzed and stop running away. So snake venom has neurotoxins. It also wants the mouse to bleed to death, so there's anticoagulants. It also wants to cause organ failure, particularly renal failure. And so snake venom has groups of toxins called nephrotoxins. And then it wants the meat to be nice and tender, caused by rhabdomyolysis. And that's what myotoxins do. This can be summarized in the word cramp. Coagulopathy, renal failure, muscle breakdown, and paralysis. And there's actually a small number of people that actually die from antivenom, um, which triggers an anaphylactic reaction. Where are the top 10 venomous snakes in the world? And how many of these are in Australia? Some of you may already know, but all 10 are in Australia. The most venomous is the inland taipan. And this is one of my favorite videos of all time. Um, of Steve Irwin wrestling with an inland taipan in central Australia. Have a look at it. Um, just some, a few statistics. Um, how many snake bites are in Australia per year? How many of these actually result in envenomation? And then out of those that have had envenomation, how many people actually die? And how does this number compare to our nearest neighbors, Papua New Guinea? Well, there's about 3,000 bites per year. Out of these, 150 actually result in systemic envenomation. And out of this whole 3,000 of bites, only three actually result in death. And the most, most of these deaths are from brown snakes um, because of their close proximity to um, large populations, particularly around Sydney. So in reality, you have a 99.9% .9 chance of survival if you get bitten by a snake in Australia. Now this is quite in contrast to Papua New Guinea, where there's a 15% adult fatality rate. And if you're a child in Papua New Guinea and bitten by a snake, one in four of you will die. So this is a boy I saw in Port Moresby in 2013 when I went over there as a registrar. And um, you can see he was bitten by a snake after school. He's still got his school uniform. He's got ptosis. He was completely paralyzed, incontinent of urine, as you can see. But he could just squeeze my hand and um, answer questions, yes or no, based on squeezing my hands. So quite a, a horrific disease. So there's five types of venomous snakes in Australia. Brown, black, tiger, taipan, death, adder. Um, brown snakes are notorious for bleeding. Black snakes mainly cause renal failure and rhabdomyolysis, whereas your tiger and taipan cause both bleeding and paralysis. Your death adder is one of the few that uh, causes primarily paralysis. So based on the clinical picture of the patient, you can kind of get some clues as to which snake might have bit them. Let's talk about a case called Tyrone. This is based on um, a case I saw in Mount Isa. So Tyrone was a 14-year-old boy living, living out on a cattle station. It's the school holidays and he's mowing the lawns. And he felt something sharp scratch his left ankle. He's feeling a bit sleepy and unable to keep his eyes open. And when you examine him, he's got some descending paralysis, difficulty swallowing, and some puncture marks on his left ankle. So this is a summary from the TOX handbook of how to assess a snake bite. There's specific history questions, including early symptoms that the patient might be experiencing and any pre-hospital um, treatment. Physical examination focuses on signs of envenomation. So looking for bleeding. Is there any evidence of abnormal bleeding? Is there signs of descending paralysis? The lab results are mainly looking for a coagulopathy. So doing coags is very important, and also doing your renal function, um, and also your CK, which me measures muscle breakdown. So those are the key points of snake bite assessment. Let's go into a bit more detail. So this was the snake that Tyrone brought into the hospital to me 
in uh, Mount Isa, much to the um, screaming of the nurses. A bit scary when you have a dead snake in your department. Hopefully it is dead. It looks pretty dead to me, I'd say. So, examination. If you think of it as the five reasons of how you can die, cramp, examining, you want to look for signs of coagulopathy, bleeding from um, the bite site, gums, enlarged lymph nodes. For R, renal failure, you want to check that they're still making urine. A, anaphylaxis, so if you've given some antivenom, making sure you, they're not getting into wheeze or get a rash or th have throat swelling. Examination of muscle breakdown, it's always useful to ask, uh, you know, for palpate for muscle tenderness over the quads and the arms, and paralysis. Again, the classic descending paralysis of snake bites, as opposed to your ascending paralysis, such as with Guillain-Barre or tick paralysis. So it's descending paralysis means the small muscles of the face and cranial nerves are the first to go, then, then leading to limb weakness and respiratory muscles. So, this is Tyrone. Um, before he came in, the ambulance had put on a uh, pressure mobilization bandage, and he had two fang marks on his ankle, and he did have some bilateral ptosis when he arrived. When you looked in his mouth, he had some bleeding from his gums, a bit of bleeding from the bite site after an hour, and had some lymphadenopathy. So this leads on to investigations. Again, you want to check for coagulopathy and you want to do these blood tests. You want to check renal function for creatinine, muscle breakdown, measuring CK and troponin. Remember, tr muscle of the heart can also be damaged, so that's why troponin is useful. And paralysis of the respiratory muscles in particular can be measured by your peak expiratory flow meter. So what did Tyrone have? Well, his initial blood tests were normal. This was at 2.15. And then an hour and a half later, his INR, which is a measure of coagulation, was unrecordable, greater than 10. His urine was negative for myoglobin, and he did have a slightly reduced peak expiratory flow rate. So this boy has neurotoxicity, ptosis and res reduced respiratory effort, and his coagulation profile shows a coagulopathy. What snake could this be? Well, if we're still not sure, we can use a snake venom detection kit. So this does not help decide if envenomation is present, because envenomation is a clinical diagnosis based on exam and investigations. But what the SVDK does help you decide, once you've, you've made the decision that they've got envenomation, then using the SVDK will help identify which snake venom is on the wound and decide, help you decide which monovalent antivenom to give. Monovalent means an antivenom specific for each specific snake, whereas polyvalent is a mixture of multiple antivenoms together. So you take a swab, break off the swab, this is the swab here, swab the wound, break off the tip into this yellow vial, tip a few drops into each of these wells, then you rinse it out, add these reagents, this gray and blue one, and then one of these vi uh, wells will change a blue color, and that will tell you which snake uh, venom is on the skin. So this boy has neurotoxicity and a consumptive coagulopathy. This is taipan envenomation. So taipan, again, going back to that table I showed you earlier, Taipan causes bleeding and paralysis. Tiger snakes can also do the similar picture. So what can we do about it? Well, don't freak out is the advice I have for you. So first aid, resuscitation, envenomation. So see if they've got envenomation. Give antivenom and call for help. So first aid means a pressure immobilization bandage. And this stops the lymphatic transport of the venom to the systemic circulation. And that buys you time to get to hospital where you can give antivenom. Resus, do your ABCs. Envenomation, that's where you want to put everything together. Check the history, exam, get your investigations back. And if there's clinical signs of envenomation, then you do your SVDK and give antivenom. You might need other 
uh, antidotes such as blood products or dialysis for re severe rhabdo and renal failure. And always call for help. Your friendly toxinologist is always just a phone call away. So what did Tyrone have? He had a pressure mobilization bandage. He had Taipan antivenom. And he did need a bit of ventilatory support. In this case, he didn't actually need intubation. This boy, however, this was uh, the, the child I saw in Papua New Guinea. He did get intubated, and he had um, descending paralysis from um, the Taipan in, in PNG. This was him four days later in ICU, giving me the thumbs up. And I went back the next day to see him, and he was already discharged and had left the hospital. So that's a happy ending. And that's the end of our mini lecture. Thanks, everyone.